Joining the Dots Bite Size on Translating Research, brought to you by Connect Health Tech. I'm Paula Rogers Brown, and in this 15 minute podcast, Anita from the university's Office for Translational Research gives advice and guidance on how to translate research, including the support OTR can provide, the benefits of engaging specialist support for research translation. And Anita also talks about a successful project supported by OTR that uses AI to detect heart valve disease. We hope you enjoyed this short interview. Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Hi Anita, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to share today um, advice and tips for this Joining the Dots Bite Size podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. So let's get started straight away. This is all about translating research. So can you explain to me, Anita, what are the available options for a researcher or clinician wishing to take a research project further but are unsure of the next steps? Hi, Paula. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this podcast. The best thing is to talk to facilitators. Uh, There are people around you who are there to help you. Um, And whether you're a clinician, and in this case, you can definitely go to Cambridge Enterprise uh, in Cambridge. Daphne is there, is a person linking CUH and Cambridge Enterprise. You can come and talk to us at the Office for Translational Research. We cater for the whole of the university of Cambridge and associated hospitals. If you're a researcher, the same applies to you. In addition, depending at which stage your project is at um, and which theme you're working on, um, there are a number of networks uh, or school associated people like um, Cambridge Academy for Therapeutic Sciences, for example, that can help you. Or if the project is say, associated with um, target identification, you might want to go to speak to Catherine Chapman from the Milner Institute. So it really, it doesn't matter per se as to who you're talking to. Uh, we will send you to the right person, depending on the on the, uh, your project specifically, your female and where it's at in the translation. And that's the first thing to assess is what stage of uh, translation your project is at. That's great. And, and of course, Connect Health Tech as an online community can help with that triaging process just post a question if you're not sure of what to do where to go um, exactly i mean by all means you know connect to the person whoever is the closest the easily accessible to to you whether it's your uh, up at the maxwell on the west side or on a biomedical campus here or online to take whatever is easiest for you we, there will be someone behind the scene who will point you in the right direction yeah fantastic great advice there anita So what are the key factors to consider if you are looking to translate your research? What do you need to know or should be considering first of all? Uh, Well, this really depends on your innovation. I mean, there's a whole load of things that need to be taken into account and and, and it depends where your intervention will be. So if it's a medical device, for example, there's a load of things like regulation that that needs to be taken into account. Um, So I've actually posted a video on Connect Health Tech about what is the whole process uh, about that. So I advise to have a look (laughs) at what what you need to think about in terms of bringing it to the market, who are the key players to bring in, what type of experiments you need to consider, what type of clinical validation, who you need to speak to in terms of, say, toxicology or regulation and so on. So that's kind of for medical device. But in any case, even if it's not a medical device, it can be an intervention, it can be a drug, IP is key. So intellectual property. So you need to look carefully of what you have and you need to protect it. It doesn't mean that if you don't have an IP, you can't translate it into something useful for the patient. But it really helps because you usually need a vehicle to deploy your intervention, whether it's through licensing or whether it's through a spin-out company. So then you need to think carefully about generating useful data and clinical data uh, that are useful for MHRAs, that is, so that it can go through accreditation, again, whether it's a drug or a device, yeah. So that's the main thing. Uh, But adding on to that is how are you going to access funding to get there? 
right? And and that's of course everybody wants funding to 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 get to that uh, level, and so that's where you need to be careful about when, say, if you want to incorporate and if you want to do a spin out, which again might be or might not be the best route. It all depends on on which projects. Uh, how are you going to access funding? Because uh, if you incorporate too early, you might not be able to access uh, public funding. So think about carefully how you're going to fund your late preclinical and your early clinical study. Right, and that is key. Look into how you can make an attractive package for industry. So you need to put yourself in their shoes to see whether it's something that you would take on board and what would you need to be sure that uh, this innovation will fly and to take that on board, whether you're putting yourself in the sense in the, in the shoes of the NHS or of an investors or a company. Yeah, so really understanding the market need really doing that market analysis, talking to people, whether it is within the NHS healthcare system stakeholders or it's industry you're looking at, do your research on the market. Is there a market need for your product, your service, your innovation? Yeah, absolutely. Look at the regulation and ensure that, you know, it, the IP is, is right. So there seems to be a lot there for people to consider. What support then does specialists like the Office for Translational Research offer and who can access it? Well, anybody on the campus and in the University of Cambridge can access us and actually even further if we can see how that can work. So by all means, come and talk to us. What we provide, we assess the project to see where it is uh, in terms of translation. And quite often people think they are somewhere and they're not, and there are other consideration to take into account. And there's also the big picture of your project and what you want to achieve. And we're trying to see, most of the time, you need funding, right? We're trying to see how we can separate the bits of your project into chunkable sizes that would fit into the requirement of a funder. And therefore, we can identify what is the best funding scheme for your project or part of your project. And whether that, you know, that's for a public funding scheme or whether that's for investors or whether that's for a, a company spinning out, for example. So we work very closely with Cambridge Enterprise and we can help you first to see where you are, what would be the next stage and kind of be an outsider, we're kind of internal consultant really. So uh, provide um, uh, an outside mind to your project and ask the difficult questions uh, about who will be using it, how is it gonna be you, your client and, and or, or administrated or all kinds of things. So um, yes, that's what we, we provide in a nutshell is, is expertise on how to progress your project forward and also project management that supports that. Management is essential when you reach translation. It's not quite like discovery, science discovery. You need to be able to follow what you said that you would do, reach certain milestone within a certain budget and timeline. So this is key and that's where we can help you as well. Brilliant. So if I was a researcher or a clinician and I've, you know, I've done my market research, I really think there's something in my, my research project that can be translated what stage of the process should I be engaging specialists like yourself and your team in OTR? Anytime, as early as possible, right? Come whenever, we will tell you where we're at. And if you're like way too early in discovery, we will tell you come back in two years. <laughs> or if you're like, you know, way too late, I don't think this has happened yet. Uh, you know, anytime, just come and have a chat. We are in the offices <laughs> across uh, the CUH and we can go to the Maxwell Centre or anywhere. Just come and talk to us and anytime is fine. Brilliant, that's great. And uh, so there should be really clear benefits of engaging the right people at the right time, I, I would imagine. But um, from your perspective, Anita, having been in this area for a, a number of years, what are the benefits of engaging the right people at the right time in terms of research projects? Yes, yeah, so it's really something we, we look at as well is who are the partners that you're trying to engage at that time during your project and are they the right partner? There's no point bringing 
an industry like AZ, for example, who's saying, oh, yes, uh, surely uh, AZ is doing something and they can fund a little bit of that if it doesn't make sense for the project, right? So it, it needs, everybody needs to have something they bring to the table and everybody needs to come out with something, right? We need that win-win situation there. Uh, and that's uh, a key to the partnership. Great. Absolutely great. So can you briefly tell us about a successful project that um, OTR has been involved in? Sure. Someone from Department of Engineering came to us and said, we've developed this um, algorithm that can detect heart valve disease. Oh, like, okay, right, what is it and what's the need and, and what do you want to do? So we try to define the need and the care pathway that is associated with that. So it turns out that this disease affects about 2% of the adult population. People go to their GP and the GP accuracy is about 75%. And then usually the GP goes and refer for an echocardiogram and two thirds of these do not result in any follow up. So we have now the, the care pathway. This is what happens, right? And it incurs significant cost to the health system. So, okay, we have this new uh, AI system capable of detecting the pathology and the severity. And by using a recording of the heartbeat, we can train the AI algorithm and make an intelligent stethoscope. And uh, that would be with a higher accuracy than a GP can do. So then we're looking at different marketing options. Is it something that we could license, license the software to stethoscope manufacturer, for example? Or is it something that we make our own stethoscope that people will use at home and self-test? Or, or do you file a patent for the software? So that's kind of where we were at at the time. So we're kind of defining the, the innovation. We found out that the strategy, you know, the defining the strategy there was there was a need to refine the, the AI system and, and to have a, a bigger amount of uh, sound recordings that was associated with the echocardiogram that data so we can link the two and the pathology and see whether it was more accurate or not. So the team went on to do a, a funding application to the MRC DPFS, which was successful and went on for three years. And it worked in that it really showed that uh, there was an increased accuracy. Uh, but then there was other challenges. So they've used manufacturers that had uh, stethoscopes which could Bluetooth to their uh, software. But it still required skilled people to know where to apply the, the stethoscope on, on a people's skin to monitor rightly. So it works in the sense that it detects better, but you still need skilled people. And so that means it, it you could further decrease the cost it involves in the NHS. And the idea behind it was to have less skilled people being able to use that innovation. So they're now looking at a new design where you don't need a test of stethoscope per se. There will be kind of sensors on your skin that you know, the, a GP can apply and that can detect uh, the murmur. And this actually innovation has just featured on BBC Look East. So you can all know about it and have a look uh, on the, of what they've done on the, on the app. It's super cool, actually. <laughs> So yeah, have a look and we are really proud to be involved and it still carries on. So there's always some refinement to be done and here we're going to the refinement part, uh, but it's very exciting. It is. That sounds fantastic. So yeah, we'll have to uh, look at that. BBC Look East, remember to look that up. That's brilliant. That's a great story. And the journey there that you explained, Anita, it, it, it makes it so, so clear as to what OTR do and, and how you get involved in projects. Just like to, to touch upon now, your own experience and drawing on your own experience, what are the key factors in building good industry academic relationships for research projects? What are those key factors? Yeah, I mean, I've already kind of hinted to that. It's, it's basically you want to really look for the win-win situation, right? This, this is key in that. Why are we partnering and what are the expectations? What are we wanting out of this collaboration? on both sides, right? It, it's not only it goes one way, you provide money and we do the research and, and kind of that's it. It's really what can we both provide to the project and what can we both take away? And that's essential. Yeah, 
that's brilliant. Understanding the benefits from both sides really is the key thing there. Well, that, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Anita. Really appreciate you joining this bite-sized podcast. Thank you, Paula. 